just in time for Christmas. The shirts are back in stock, and so are the Elvis tags. Go to SaveThe310.com, get them so that you can have the best Christmas ever. SaveThe310.com. Now, we're going to give this tag away. So, I am outside of Sean's house. Uh, I've sent him an email, haven't heard back from him, so I hope he's home. Hope we're not going to this goes well. He was the winner of the Elvis tag 1935. Now, when he placed his order back in July, he actually put as his first option 1935, because when you place your order, you can tell us what number you want, and, that's, and if it's available, that's how you get your number. Well, he put this one on there, and unfortunately, this one was already set aside for this very special thing, but he bought it, and he did it anyway. The other giveaway I was gonna do, and still I am doing, is the rotating beacon off of the jet itself. Uh, and in pure Jimmy fashion, I totally forgot it in Florida. So what I'm gonna do is continue the giveaway. So if you go and you're buying an Elvis tag or, and our shirts, we're going through some changes with that. Update coming soon. But we got the Elvis tags on there all around the world, free shipping. Just go on there and buy it. We'll, we'll ship it to you. Uh, tell us what serial number you want. All of that is helping go toward this Elvis project. You get a piece of it. You get a copy of the bill of sale of the, from the FAA showing that Elvis Presley personally owned it. Certificate of authenticity showing that yes, this is an actual. And of course, your Elvis tag and a picture of the jet whenever I bought it. So go to save the 310com get your Elvis tag. But uh, let's go see if Sean is home and surprise him. Right. That's the, the right, uh... I feel like a salesman holding like your flip book. Have you your life insurance? Hey, I uh, am standing here at your house. I don't know if you got my emails, but I, uh, I brought you a gift. Uh, the 1935 Elvis Presley tag. Really? Yeah, yeah, you won, you won it. Uh, we did a drawing, uh, I don't know, about a month ago or something like that. And I sent you an email telling you you won it. And then I tried to send you another couple of emails seeing when you could be here so that I could swing by and give it to you. Well, I am in town, uh, passing, coming through on my way back to Florida. So I have it here and I'm giving it to, I'm assuming your son. And, um, but it's right here for you. So whenever you get off work, it'll be waiting for you. Oh man, that's crazy. That's unbelievable. That's awesome. Yeah, so you have the 1935 Elvis tag uh, that's gonna be waiting for you when you get home. Oh, thank you so much. My pleasure. So, all right, well, I will uh, let you get back to work and uh, you'll take a picture of this and then tag, you know, tag us tag it or send me an email whenever you get it so I make sure you got it. I will, man. Yeah, I've been watching all the ones in the, you've been at the museum doing the spruce goose. My, grand, my grandfather was a pilot and uh, so it's been awesome. Me and him spent some time there. It's, it's been really good. So it's awesome. Well, fantastic. Well, I'm glad you won this uh, and, you know, put it somewhere it's already framed for you and all that good stuff. So there you go. Congratulations. Thanks, man. Sorry I couldn't be there. So. Ah, uh, no worries, man. All right, you have a great one. Thank you. All right, bye. All right, and what's your name? Levi. Levi. Yeah. Jimmy. So, Sean, here's, I'm giving it to your son, Levi. Don't drop that. <laughs> Congratulations, and uh, yeah, whenever your dad gets here, just have him give a, take a picture, and then tag us with Elvis Jet or Save the 310 or something like that. He knows yeah. how to get on the channel. Yeah. Awesome. Let's get back on the road. All right, bye, you guys. Thank you. Nice to meet you. You as well. There you go. Good kid. You cannot come to Southern California without visiting Plains of Fame Museum. Let's go in and check it out. So this is the right. This is the right flyer, 1903, and the Wright brothers were two bicycle guys from Dayton, Ohio, and they had this affinity to to fly an airplane eventually. So what they stood started doing is they started building gliders and at the eight, late, late 1800s, early 1900s and uh, the Wright brothers would call up or write a letter to the National Weather Service and say and where is the best place on the East Coast that has wind that we can try to get a, try to get a plane airborne 
And so they would write back, you got to go to the Outer Banks of North Carolina. So they built a really nice glider and took that apart up in Dayton, Ohio, put that on a train and transported that down to uh, the order, Outer Banks of North Carolina, better known as the Kitty Hawk. So what you see in the background is a diorama of Kitty Hawk. So they would put it back together in that oh. what looks like a barn over there. And then they would go out to the sand dunes because there's nothing around there besides wind and space. And they would fly their glider. And over time, uh, because they studied from Chanute, and uh, what's that, Chanute? Chanute is a gentleman who uh, was trying to fly in the 18, late 1800s, and he was a gentleman who had figured out mathematically different things about wing structure and lift and things like that. So they studied him, and uh, eventually felt confident enough in flying their glider where they would go back to Dayton, Ohio and they wanted to put an engine on their, uh, on their glider. And they, they talked to some automobile manufacturers and the ma manufacturers could not build the engine that they wanted. So they designed their own engine. They had an employee at the bicycle shop named Charlie Taylor and he put together an engine for them that you see right there. So that engine is 12 horsepower. 12 horsepower. Um, it weighs approximately 120 to 140 pounds right in there. And they put that on the plane and so then they were ready to come back to Dayton, Ohio. Or excuse me, come back to uh, the Outer Banks of North Carolina. So they took the plane apart again, put it on a train back to uh, the Outer Banks of North Carolina and put everything back together again in the barn back there and then uh, decided that they were going to fly that on December 13th. So they had a coin flip to see who was going to fly first, Orville or Wilbur. And Wilbur won, but Wilbur crashed the plane on the 13th, had to take a couple days to fix it, so now it was Orville's turn to fly it on the 17th. And so Orville had a 12 second run of 120 feet, which is like that wall to the wall behind us, and that was the first flight of the day. By the end of the day, they did four total flights, and Wilbur did the last flight, and Wilbur went for 59 seconds over 800 feet. Wow. Wilbur gets off the plane, a gust of wind comes up, takes the plane and destroys the plane from that point on. But they were happy with their results and they go back to Dayton, Ohio from that point on. So uh, that kind of starts everything. But what I like to tell people when I give tours is the fact that when you look at the plane, there really are four pieces of a bicycle that make up this plane. So the four pieces would be the sprocket. Mm -hmm. You see the chain around the sprocket, um, which is attached to the uh, propellers, you see a, a black frame there. If you take the black frame and you turn it on its side, oh. that's a bicycle frame. <laughs> it does look like a bicycle so you put frame. A, you put the tire on both ends of it. And then the fourth piece, which is very difficult to find, is down here on the center. Oh. And that's the hub, which is where your tire would fit onto. Oh, interesting. And the reason you would need the hub is because you're going to come over here to the Outer Banks poke holes in it. And you need that track right there to go down that rail. That's what uh, you would need that for. So you had a gentleman on each end of the wings. You'd have Wilbur or Orville flying it on their stomach. And then they would push it down there with starting up the engine. And by the time it gets to the end of the rail, it would have some lift to it and would be up in the air for anywhere from the first flight to the fourth flight of the day. Yeah. Now, do I spy, and I've, I've heard, but I haven't looked at it, that one of the great things they discovered about the controllability was to have ailerons or a type of aileron where they would flex the wing Correct. and is that what the chain and the pulleys and those cables are there so they would flex the wing? Part of it but what they would do is lie on their stomach and you're right they have an elevator out in front so that gives you your um, give, gives you pitch okay mm -hmm. and then you have your um, rudder in the back which gives you your yaw and the ailerons always give you your roll. You don't see ailerons on there, but what they did is lay on their stomach, they would attach one of the cables to their left hip, to the left wing, cable to the right hip, to the right wing, and then they would move their hips, and that's what give that them the roll. And they called it wing warping, is what they called that. So yeah. they talk about being a drummer, they're doing this and going absolutely, like this. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and everybody always wants, why is there an elevator in the front? 
because the elevator is always on the back of planes. The reason it is in the front was because if the plane went down, it would protect them from hitting the ground. That was the idea when they first started that. There you go. There yeah. you go. Yeah. The first airplane was a canard airplane. And correct. That's there, correct. That's there you exactly go. Right. And then uh, the, co the copper piece you see right there, that's a radiator to keep oh, okay. the engine cool. And then the other um, darker cylinder part is where the fuel would go. That's like a gas tank right there okay. for them. And then they had to hand carve both of the propellers. Uh, they hand carve those out of spruce and they counter, they go counter to each other. Counter First counter spin. rotating as counter well. Rotate them. So <laughs> they go the same way, they obviously it's too much torque yeah. one way or the other. So they would do the counter rotation. That's correct. So this is 1953 you're looking at. It's the 50th anniversary of the original build in 1903. So this is a 1953 replica, 50th anniversary of that. So if you do today's time, that's e this is even 70 years old right here. The question yeah. I get is, has it ever flown? And I don't know the answer to that. It might have tried, but I don't know that. But it, it is the replica from 1903. Original wins in the Smith, Smithsonian Institute and back in Washington, D.C. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Wow, that's pretty neat. Turn a look at the replica of the Apollo 11. That's right. The first guys to walk on the moon, and then you have 66 years of progression of of aviation right there. And our, our pretty much our museum is everything between 1903 and 1969. Okay. We have some World War One, mostly World War Two, and we get into Korea and Vietnam a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And and what I what I love is it's called the planes uh, or the warbirds that fly or right. something like that. We're called Planes of Fame. Yeah. Air Museum. And uh, the slogan though. Correct. Well, well, you can call war, war birds that fly, yeah, because we do a special program first Saturday of every month where we fly a different warbird. That is and, pretty cool. And uh, it'll bring six to 800 people in on a Saturday to watch them well, not only start up out here, but you'll watch them fly overhead for 20 minutes, take some pictures. Um, it'll come back in. Um, it'll go to our hot ramp area, which is just on the other side of the fence there. And the pilot gets out, we hand him a bottle of water and a microphone and uh, he answers questions from the public. And it's a real popular program. Oh, uh, that's a good idea. Iconic warbirds fly. Yeah. December's our biggest day because we fly our Japanese Zero in December, and that's the closest day to Pearl Harbor. Oh, yeah. And yeah. this is the last Zero in the world with the original Japanese engine still in it. The really? The Mitsubishi Nakajima engine still Will we get to aircraft. see that? We will. Awesome. We'll Fantastic. We'll we go out there. So, okay, in this hangar here, we got some pretty iconic things. I mean, yep. no introduction needed for the Mustang. We, T6 or a S&J? and J. Yeah, S&J. It's yeah, the same as the T6, the yeah. Navion. Yeah, Navion, okay. And then how many of these airplanes in here still operate? They might not fly, but right. you can still start them up or they we, could be flown. Yeah, we have approximately 120 aircraft here and 31 still fly. Everything in this room flies except for the two against the wall. That is amazing. So when you first, the, the, so let's go over there because I'd like to talk about them just quickly with you. So the three planes against the wall are, are built by Boeing and built in Washington, Washington, state of Washington. So you first have the one in front of you is an FD-5. They made 27 of these. And when they came out of the factory, they barged them over to our first aircraft carrier, which was the oh, USS yeah. Langley. Yep. That's probably, that plane is probably one of them that's on there, right there. Oh, wow. And so they would take off from the aircraft carrier. They wouldn't land on it, but they'd take off from the aircraft carrier. This is the last one of the 27 they built right here. So the serial number 27, if it had a... Yeah, I'm not sure what the serial number on it would be, but it's the last one of 27 built. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. wait, you just said they, they don't land on the aircraft carrier. Correct. Where the heck do they land? Probably got to land. Somewhere oh, yeah. so they just take off from the boat, do their thing, Correct. and then land somewhere. Correct. Correct. Gotcha. So it's an inline engine, and it would be water cooled. Has a lot of fabric on it. That's why you have uh, the the engine on this is not as powerful on the next engine. So the next one, that re so this one, the FD4 replaced this one, the, uh, on to the one we just talked about. So now we take a radial engine because mm -hmm. it has more weight on the plane, and instead of being water cooled, it's now air cooled. And that was the idea behind that. So a lot more weight on the plane. Uh, you have a lot more metal, less fabric, 
More wood in the wood in the, in the spars. So what do we got like speed wise, and would this carry bombs or guns or? Uh, no, because it never did any combat. Because you're in the 20s, so no combat. I'm still in the 20s. Mostly like reconnaissance type stuff. Correct. correct okay. Correct. Where now we get to the third plane, and now you, you start talking more about uh, war. So this is another Boeing product. That looks like a speed racer. It looks that way. It's modified. the first. Pro, pro, it's the first airplane Boeing builds. And that's all metal, and it's a monoplane. So a lot more weight, but it's the same engine that would have been in that F4B over there. Same engine that you have over there. Looking at something that's going uh, probably three to four hundred miles an hour. This five, thing would go five, that fast? Well, no, I, I think it backwards. I'm thinking of horsepower. About 500 horsepower. So it probably go around anywhere from 150 to 210, somewhere in there. Yeah, okay. But it was built as a fighter. Um, when we look at the top front cowling on it, you'll notice that there's a 50 caliber machine gun in here. There's two of them, in fact. Oh, they, oh they're right through here. Right through the cowling. So, so you think that that's going to shoot off your propeller. But there's an interrupter system in there, so it interrupts whenever the propeller is in front of the guns. So does it have, is it a gear on there that is controlling the trigger, similar, or is similar it? Similar to that, yeah, similar to that, that's correct. And then if you look at the top, this is called a P-26 pea shooter. And always people want to know, why is it called a pea shooter? So one of the two reasons, and you can just pick which one you want, it's either because of the guns out through the cowling, or if you look up here, you'll see there's a gun sight that black gun sight, and it looks like you can put a P in there and just blow through it, and it'll go through the other end of it. So oh, that's go. how it got the name of the pea shooter. When they first started building these, they did not have um, anything for your neck. To, there's no neck brace up there. And so early on, uh, somebody had landed the plane and went too far over and it went uh, the nose up, uh, nose down, and uh, broke their neck and was killed. So eventually over time, they decided to put the, the neck brace on there. Okay. But it has fixed landing gear, as you can see. Yeah. Uh, braces on the wings. So all the aerodynamic, the, the sheet metal work around it to make it swoopy is all factory. Yeah. Factory. It, it reminds me of the the GBs or yeah. what was yeah, just, yeah, except yeah. it's longer. If it was just a lot shorter, yeah, that it would be yeah, GB. Well, we'll, I'll take you up there. We'll see a GB. We'll really? see one. Of, we have one here. Yeah, it's a replica, but we'll have one here. But you see. Uh, so don't forget, these are not landing on concrete like we're standing on today. You're landing in fields mm -hmm. of mud, dirt, gravel. So you don't want that to get caught in your wheels. That's why they have the uh, protecting the wheels to get that off of there. That is neat. Okay. And then the Navion, of course, trainer plane. Well, yeah, more or less, well, more, more liaison, more for liaison purposes. The cheap version of the, it's because it's built by North Americans, and mm -hmm. we built the P-51, it's a cheaper version of a Mustang that he would use for liaison purposes. What do yeah. you know of this so one? So SNJ um, is the Navy version of a T-6. Mm -hmm. So uh, S standing for Scout, um, N standing for Trainer, and the J standing for North American. And so the Navy, that's how they designate oh, their planes. They I didn't use know the letters J's to do this. For North yeah, you would, you would never know J is North American. You'd think J, it would be N or something like that. But no, he got, he got the J. Hmm. Just like Grumman got an F. That's what, <laughs> they got. that's what they got. So this is kind of interesting because this is part of the history of this airport. When you first come to this airport in 1940, which is why it was built, they taught over 10,000 pilots to go off to World War II. And there was nothing around here at the time. That's why they designated this uh, training base. So you had to fly a Stearman, mm -hmm. which is a bi-wing plane, yeah. much like those two right there. Yeah. And then when you're done with the Stearman, you're going to be flying a BT-13, which is a basic trainer, which, we use, which is usually sitting behind you, except for the BT-13 is still in Santa Maria, I've been told. And then once you're certified with those two, then you did have to leave this airport, and then you had to be certified on a T-6. And then once you were certified on that, then you became either a bomber pilot or a fighter pilot, fighter, fighter pilot from there. And that, that's 1940. So 1940 to 1944, that's what they trained the guys to do that were here. When the war ended, then it became important because what do you do with all these propeller planes? Because you're getting into the jet age. So all the, a lot of the propeller planes came here because it was so vast and nothing around. So they would line up B-17s, 
P-47s, P-51s, and most of them were taken out the engine and they would put the planes fuselages back to back. And then if you wanted to, they opened it up and you could buy some of these planes to the general public. You could have bought a P-51 for $1,500. I know, boy, if you had a time machine. <laughs> At $1,500 in 1946, it's still a lot of money, but still, it's a lot better than three, four million today. So most people would come down to buy a plane, but they'd buy it for the fuel. Fuel is more important to have than the plane. But Because they'd uh, still have fuel in it? Oh yeah, still have fuel in it. Huh. But what would happen is, uh, if you didn't buy some of the planes, they have this 17 ton piece of metal that would, they would just land on the plane, cut it in half, and melt it down and build your next refrigerator, or maybe your next um, uh, oven out of that. Mm -hmm. And so our original founder who lived around here, but he was a young kid at the time, young being 16, 17, 18 at the time, that was killing him. He says, You're, we're ruining history. What are we doing? That's right. So he made it a mission to try to start protecting and saving and getting planes. So he acquired 10 and in 1957 opened up his own museum 30 miles from here called in Claremont, California and just called it the Air Museum. And so that's how he started. It was the, really the first aviation museum west of the Mississippi wow. back in 1957. And what was his name? His name was Ed Maloney. Ed so Maloney. Ed, Ed was key for us. Ed passed away about seven years ago and left everything to his son and daughter who still run the museum today. But he saved over 200 airplanes um, and started our collection that you see today. And he was great at trading and buying and bartering and auctioning planes over time. That's my kind of guy. Yeah, that good guy, that's why, He's a Jimmy thank Rule goodness, guy. that's what we have here. Yeah. Wow. So how we turned into the planes of fame was he, mu he moved his museum down to Buena Park in the early 70s because there was a, a museum down there called Cars of the Stars and he was going to merge with them and they called the planes planes of fame. It lasted two to three years and then they, it went belly up after that and he had to go somewhere else. So he went to, uh, came find land down here in 1973, 74 and kept the tag planes of fame. So that's why you see planes of fame air museum. That, there you go, super neat. And uh, yep. It's a good plane, you see a lot of these around. So the, you still the see the penny in there? The 1340s. Yep. They all have the penny of the same year. That's correct. Of the engine. Correct. Yep. And they're the only ones, the aero engines are the only ones certified or allowed to change or do anything with that penny. Correct. Isn't yeah. that the nuttiest, yeah. weirdest like yeah. that? Yeah. Who would have thought? Huh? <laughs> Who would have thought? Yeah. Great. Yeah. I'll take you to the next hangar. All right. Thank you so much. This yeah. is yeah, no problem. this is great. Our planes fly right there. there Boom. Go. So when you see drip pans, that means our planes fly. And it still has oil in it. They, if they, it's they, still they better leak oil. That's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Cars yeah. you don't want to leak oil. Planes you do. That's right. Means they're alive. So we'll walk into the pond hangar. Now you were in Palm Springs yesterday. Yeah. So Bob Pond mm -hmm. started that museum 25 years ago. He's very good friends with Ed Maloney, and donated his amount of money and we call this the pond hangar after him and built built the hangar. So this is a lot of the World War II aircraft in here, the warbirds. Everything pretty much flies in here uh, except for what's against the wall. A lot of these were gone yesterday to Santa Maria. So come on, let's start over here in the far left and yeah, then we'll circle right. around. Because this, this plane is really iconic. People walk by this plane and they'll think it's just an old airplane. But there's some really good history to this plane. This is, you're looking at 1938 when you look at the plane. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna back up a little bit. A lot of people know who Charles Lindbergh was. Oh yeah. So Charles Lindbergh in 1927 takes the Spirit of St. Louis, flies it from New York to Paris. Yeah. And the guy who um, was the master mechanic on his plane was a guy named Douglas Corrigan. Okay. And Douglas Corrigan put the gas tanks in the Spirit of St. Louis. He made the wings 10 feet longer, built a lot of the cockpit in there. In fact, the day that Charles Lindbergh left San Diego, he took the chocks from the front wheel, moved the chocks, and off he went to um, uh, New York, and of course then to Paris. But the big thing about that was Douglas Corrigan was so enamored that he was going to that uh, Charles Lindbergh was going to fly to Paris. He says, "I'm going to do the same thing someday, but I'm flying to Dublin, Ireland." Okay. So now fast forward six years, you're in 1933, he buys this plane, this is a 1929 Curtis Robin, 
and it's four years old when he buys it. It looks a lot better than it does today, obviously. And he starts modifying it. He starts putting in gas tanks on it. He um, puts a new and different engine on it. He starts from an 85 horsepower engine, 165 horsepower engine on it. And then two years later, 1935, he's gonna fly that to New York. He wants to get certified so he can fly to Dublin, Ireland. Well, they don't certify. They say, no, we're not gonna certify that. You need to do some more modifications. So he brings it back home in 1935, but if you look at the side of the plane, he, he names the plane at that time. You'll see he names it Sunshine. And he puts that sticker on both sides of the plane. He does some more modifications. What, what, what sticker? You see up oh, at the, the yellow, yellow one. The little there. yellow one. He calls the plane uh, Sunshine. Goes, flies back to Long Beach, does some more modifications. Here, keep and then all of, all of 1938 it. comes up, so now he flies it from Long Beach. Those are gas tanks, Holy fuel tanks. Crap. So Silas, he, did you notice that? So he can't see out the front window of his plane. Right, just like uh, the, so the Spirit of St. Louis. Spirit of St. But Louis. the difference is Spirit of St. Louis has a periscope. Mm -hmm. So he can look at the front and see over the plane. He never put the periscope in there. Don't know if that was a decision maker sure. of why he never got certified. But then flies from Long Beach to New York, Bennett Field in Brooklyn in 1938, and he wants to get certified again. Well, this is before the FAA. Uh, I forgot the name of the letters. It's a, it's a bureau who's certifying people. And so you have to know a little bit about history. 1937, there's a girl named Amelia Earhart. She tries to fly around the world, and we never knew what happened to her. And then in 1938, also, there's a guy by the name of Howard Hughes, and he's trying to build a plane to fly around the world. And no, they're hesitant to have anybody fly over an ocean. Yeah. Since, they, since. We've, we've had a bad experience. Exactly. Yeah, a couple of them. So he's supposed to get in the plane, fly back to Long Beach. So he gets in the plane at 5 in the morning. It's already fueled up. The manager of the airport gets up at 5 and says, whatever you do, don't take off going west because that's my office at the end of the runway. He's thinking he's never going to get the plane off the ground. So says, you head east and then you uh, rotate around to go head west. So Douglas Corrigan does that. It's a foggy day, foggy day, and he's got uh, a compass that's tw over 20 years old. It doesn't work very well. So he heads east. He thinks he's banked to head west and keeps on going. So 10 hours after he notices his feet are getting cold. He looks down and he sees he's leaking fuel. And he had that issue from Long Beach to New York. He thought he took care of it, but it's leaking fuel again. So only as Douglas Corrigan can do, he gets out uh, from behind him his toolkit and he gets a screwdriver and he pokes a hole in the canopy so let the, dr oil, the uh, gasoline drain out that right side. He didn't do it the left side because the left side's the exhaust. That's why he didn't do the left side. So then as he does that, he's looking around and he sees, he thinks, you know what, it's starting to lift up. And he says, I can, I, I can tell I'm over water. If I'm going back to Long Beach, Either there's a long lake involved or I'm, I'm going the wrong way. So he's kind of figured he's gone the wrong way and instead of going back, because now it's a 10 hour flight back, he just keeps going on. And 16 hours later after that, he sees an island up ahead. He says, I think I've noticed that runway on a map before and it's Dublin, Ireland. <laughs> So, so he, he accidentally So he accidentally <laughs> lands accidentally in, yeah, actually story. where he wanted to go lands yeah. in Dublin, Ireland. Well, the United States is not happy with him, <laughs> so they, they take away his license for 14 <laughs> days. So what do That's the Irish do? The Irish put him in the plane on a boat, send him back to New York. When he gets to New York, it's the 14th day, so now there's not really a penalty. And what does New York do? They give him a ticker tape parade bigger than they gave Charles Lindbergh. <laughs> That's hysterical. So they, so they nicknamed him Douglas Wrong Way Corrigan. That's, that's, oh, that's the famous God. story on him. He goes from city to city to city eating this up, and he signs a book contract, and he signs a movie contract. And if you like YouTube like you do, if you go on and search The Flying Irishman, you'll see a one-hour story, yeah. one-hour story on Douglas Corrigan by that plane, and it's really well done. It's very that well done. super neat, super so that's, the plane is, you know, in my opinion, it, we're lucky to have the plane here. This easily this could end. This is the actual. This is the actual yeah. plane. This could end up in the Smithsonian very easily without a doubt. But this, yeah. is, this is the plane he flew.
That is super, super. Because these two placards talk about this plane here. The little remote control one? Yeah, so it's, this is a radio plane. And why, why, why is it so important? There was, uh, when you were trying to train a pilot to designate something to shoot at in the air, we would take a plane up and we would take a windsock behind it and you had to find the windsock and shoot at the windsock. So this gentleman named Reginald Danny was an actor and he came over from England and he came up and he decided to build a factory in Van Nuys and make radio planes. Huh. So these became the target planes for our pilots. And if they didn't shoot them down, then if you notice the top, the top would open up and a parachute would come out and we, we would keep the, you wouldn't destroy it. You'd be able to keep the plane and do it again. But in the early part of that factory, Ronald Reagan at the time was not a president and Ronald Reagan was a captain in the army. So Ronald Reagan brought in a photographer to the factory to take pictures to show America what we're trying to do to prepare our pilots for war during World War II. So the photographer sees this gal working on one of the radio planes and says to her, God, you're a really good looking gal. When the war ends, you ought to become a model. So the fast forward, the war does end, she becomes a model, then she's discovered by MGM uh, Studios and they changed her name to Marilyn Monroe. So that's how Marilyn Monroe Are you serious? was discovered. So yeah. President now, that Ray, Reagan. We have the hindsight 2020, President Ronald Reagan, captain in the army, went to go take with, a, video with a photographer, photographer uh -huh. and then this pretty young lady was working in there and the photographer said, hey, you knew that. That was Marilyn Monroe. That's Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Back then her name is, if you see the bottom, her name was Norma Jean Doherty oh, that's right, because yeah. she had just gotten married and she's 18 years old, you know, and so. <laughs> Like yeah. The smallest thing yeah. you never know. I know. That's why the from a radio plane to Marilyn Monroe. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Very interesting Big story. That is super neat. There you go. Yeah. So, yeah. so now we start talking about World War II. Now you have a P-47. That's a G model. Uh, G models never really left the states. They became trainers. Uh, they were uh, built by Republic. Uh, built in. Uh, in Buffalo or, or Long Island, if I remember correctly. Great planes. Um, you can see how big this plane is. Pilots who flew these love these planes because most, much like a Timex watch, they can take a uh, licking and Same keep on ticking, so to speak. Also. And if you look at the wings on them, you'll see there's four 50 caliber machine guns. Now you see how it's recessed a little bit? Oh yeah. So that's how you can set in your uh, ammunition and the wings from that plane. And it just happens to be the uh, length of a shell. Good. Look at that. 50 caliber. Yeah. Pretty, yeah, pretty, pretty powerful. Uh, R2800 engines. They had really strong engines. Is that four, the four, double four. stack that, I, that we see over yeah, here? Like yeah. The wasp engine? Yeah. Uh, it's this one right here. This one. Here you go, Tyler. The one that looks like it's a cutout. That's an R2800. So this engine would be in that plane. Look how strong that engine and is. And here we go, and then we've got the, the double stack radial. Your crankshaft is coming through here, connected with a gear reduction mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, and then on each one of these, all of the connecting rods for the radial that goes all the way around are on one big sprocket thing. I, forget, I keep forgetting the name of this actual piece. This actually runs. Uh, you can plug it in, mm -hmm. and it'll run. And that's our goal is to get it running again. It didn't run for quite a while, and we'll get a plexiglass in front of it, and then you, as a guest, can come over, push a button, and watch it run for 15 seconds. You know, that's that's the goal to get that thing back to do that. So do a little work, and we'll get that done. Yeah. But you can see, I mean, that's a big plane. You actually, if, if you had a P-51 sitting side by side with this, you can put a P-51 inside of this plane. That's how that's how big this plane is. It's the heaviest fighter we built. Weighs over 15,000 pounds. Good, good, good plane. So the plane behind you, that's the F4U Corsair. Oh yeah. So it's a TV star and it's a movie star. Okay. So there's a TV show in the 70s that was called Baba Black Sheep. Okay. When they changed the name to Black Sheep Squadron. Uh -huh. This was one of the eight Corsairs in that TV show. And then it just came back uh, the past year, was making a movie back in November called Devotion. I don't know if you saw that movie. Uh, it's about a Korean War um, 
African-American who flies a Corsair and is shot down, uh, hit by flak, really. And he has to land it in Korea. And uh, I can't tell you more than that because you have to watch the movie. No, it's, right, it's, it's, it's good, but it's a good. But it was one of the Corsairs in the movie. Oh, super. If you watch the movie, it looks like there's 13, 14 Corsairs in there, which is CGI, but there's probably three or four. That's all yeah. that's in there. But uh, yeah, strong plane. And then Disney came here in the early uh, uh, 2000s, and they were going to make a movie called Planes and Planes Fire and Rescue. And because uh, maybe they made the movies on the cars, Cars 1, yeah. Cars 2, so they did one on planes. So they wanted to sketch some of our planes, and they ended up putting two of the planes in the movie. One is the GB that you talked yeah. about, and the other one is the Corsair. And the Corsair they called Skipper. Okay. So all kids that come in, they know this as Skipper. Oh, Mommy, there's Skipper. Oh, that's what they'll know that's it as. Super neat. They won't know it as Black Sheep Squadron or Devotion, okay. but they know it as Skipper. That's, that's right. what they know it as. Yeah. In front of that is a Bearcat. That Bearcat was also in the movie Devotion. Bearcats were made by Grumman, great planes. Um, they came out near the end of World War II, and then unfortunately World War II ended, so we never got to fly these during World War II. Um, this one here is a special plane because it's, it's a recent restoration, and Grumman two planes in the 47 range, and both of those planes were built for civilians. So this is one of the two that was built for civilians. It had a belly landing on it and uh, was dis not destroyed, but pretty much destroyed. So that's how our founder got the plane. And then from other Bearcats, they restored it to what you see today. And Bearcats, the idea of them were they were built to climb. That was their idea. So it's smaller than the Hellcat. And they put it, the, the strongest engine at the time was an R2800, that same engine you saw in the P47, and that's what they put in this guy here. So it uh, could climb well. Right. But let, let's talk about this guy here. So yeah. this, is, this is the P40. P40s were famous as the uh, uh, planes that went to what they call the AVG, the American Volunteer Group, and went to China. And they would fly the, these, uh, these planes here. These were uh, very, very famous, uh, uh, the Warhawk fighter bomber. Um, this one was actually a combat veteran flown by the Canadian Royal Air Force. And what it's known to have done is it shot down a Japanese balloon bomb. I don't know if you've ever heard of balloon bombs or not, but the Japanese were building these uh, uh, balloons. And in fact, the girl, girls in high school in Japan were building these balloons and they would sending them off to the jet stream back in November, December, January. Like China did. Yep, near the, near the <laughs> end of war. It's like, it's, it's kind of similar. Yeah. And the idea was they were getting the jet stream and they would come down to North America or into Canada and then they would land on the ground. They, their goal was to land them on the ground and then when they did, the bombs would go off and they would cause forest fires. We would take our attention away from being in Japan. Just like what recently the, happened with that one. Exactly. That's weird. Or being Strange in the, or being in the Pacific itself. Islands, yeah. It, it, they never really, they never worked very well to do that. But there was a family in May of 45 that was killed in Washington because one landed, bombs didn't go off. They, they were doing a picnic and they went up to the plane and I'm sure one of them touched something they shouldn't have and exploded and they were all killed except for the husband because he watched all that happen. Yeah. And so even today you can go to Washington to find that point and they've got a statue where that had happened. Yeah. But that's what it's known to have done. So when we first got into the Pacific Islands, the Pacific War, uh, these were what went up against Japanese Zeros. Okay. So and they, they, no way could we keep up with a Japanese Zero with a P-40. But that's what we had first that was going on into that. Now how long, how did these get here? Are these part of like whose collection is this? How long is it? Yeah, this is this museum? is all part of the museum's collection. I, I don't know the year they got it. It might say on the placard there, but yeah. this is all part of the original collection that uh, Ed Maloney had saved when he did that. Yep. And then when we obviously got the plane, we could find the history by knowing the bureau number on the plane. That helped. Yeah. But it's crazy to me <coughs> looking back, right, all with hindsight. And a lot of these still today, they just go to the grinder. And, right. No, oh, absolutely. Which, I mean, I get it from the military side because yeah. they don't want competition or have any potential Correct. issues. But, Correct. Yeah. But the Flying Tigers uh, first started these in the, when they were flying with the AVG, American Volunteer Group. Um, 
And that was, a, it was, a, that was to help the Chinese out at the time. That was the idea to do that. These have Ellis, Allison engines in them, no different than what the P-51A does, has an Allison engine in it. These are made by Curtis Wright. So I'll give you a little history to kind of segue into the P-51. So when the war starts, the British are in the war before us. The British come to this company, Curtis Wright, and they say, can you build us P-40s? And we say, no, because we need to build our own and we, we can't build them fast enough for ourselves. So they go to this company called North American, which is P-51 is, and they said to North American, can you build us P-40s? And North American says, why do you want that plane? We've got a better plane than that. But, but we, don't, we haven't built any yet. We just have the specs for it. And he says, well, if you can build us one in less than 120 days, we will consider it. So they do build a P-51 in 102 days. And then they go fly that, and they love the plane. So we start building P-51s for them. And they're called A models, just like that one looks right there. Yeah. But our A models have Allison engines in them. So, is that the same or a very similar engine that's correct. in the P-40? So these are great planes. Problem is, they can only go up to 15,000 feet. And the Germans are now going 20 and 25,000 feet. So the British say, well, God, we like the plane, but the engine's not cutting it for us. So they take out the engine, because they say, we've got this engine called Rolls-Royce Merlin. Let's put that in there, game changer. Now they're going 20, 25,000 miles, uh, uh, feet up in the air. So now the problem is, we start the war, <clears throat> we're building P-51s for us, but we know that engine is really good that they have. So we say, can you build us Rolls-Royce Merlin engines? And they say, no, because we can't build them fast enough for ourselves, just like we said to them. So we go to this company called Packard, who's not building cars, nobody is, and said, can you do licensing to build P-51 Merlin engines for us? And they said, let's see if we can do that. So they did, they get the license. So our, our engines are built by Packard, mm -hmm. and so that's how we get. So we start building P-51Bs and Cs, which look just like this one, but Bs are made in Inglewood, Cs are made in Dallas. Great planes for us. But then eventually we know that pilots have difficulty seeing out of that, so that's why they built the D models. Now you can see all the way around you, and the most produced P-51s would be D models. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's kind of how the story all goes with with that, because it's really, we're building these, we're building for these for them, and who calls them a Mustang? It's the British, it's not us, it's the British call them a Mustang. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, that's... This is the last flying P-51A that still flies in the world, right here. So you're looking at a really? one of one plane. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> it's a one of one plane. Where there's a lot of D models. Yeah, and you see some C models, I think. I think uh, In fact, I was hoping you'd see one today. Uh, we C model was here just the other day. It left to go to the museum, to the um, to the air show, and it's not come back. So I just, the C, it's it's like looking just like this plane, except for it's got the Merlin engine. That's the only difference. But, yeah. but it, and there's not many Cs or Bs left. Yeah. yeah. Mostly again, they're Ds. So this this D model is called Wee Willie Two. It's really fast. It's in the Reno air races. And the neat thing about this plane is that um, it w at one time was an air racer in the 70s. It was called the Red Baron, and it crashed. And they took the Red Baron and then parts of other P-51s and then built this guy here, the Wee Willie II. This is the one I flew in the back seat of. It's a good, really good plane. Is that water injection I see for the, uh, the coolers Yeah, it's there? a supercharger. Yeah, it's not supercharged anymore, but it's supercharger. Uh huh. Yeah. Now, did they still race this one? They do. They raced uh, last month, uh -huh. the Reno Air Races. Which I'm, I'm a little, speaking of racing, we passed by one right as we walked in. Oh, did you? Well, right. Oh, yeah, Strega. Strega. Yeah. So we'll walk around, yeah. We're yeah. not, we're not there. We'll like walk around. Yeah. Correct. You see, and you can see how the cockpit is much, oh, yeah. much different. Uh, it's, it's got a Merlin engine in it, but it's a highly modified <laughs> yeah. Merlin engine in this plane. And my understanding is the, they use fuel on one wing and water or something else is on the other oh, wing because they're always in that corner. Could be. That makes sense. And so they want to use the fuel from up here because it gives them higher fuel pressure. Totally makes sense. And as they come around and it's like the thought 
that goes into the engineering of all these little things. I agree. Just Love engineers for coming up with stuff like that. Absolutely. Uh -huh. for control. Yep. And this wing will be a different dimension than that wing. And just all of it is just crazy. Because yeah, everything's banking left. You know, you're yeah. banking left the whole time around. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Everything is all banking. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah, beautiful. Last, last race in 2017, it won in 2017, in fact. It beat Strega by a few seconds. Uh, and that's the last time both of them have raced. Let's go, let's go out to the B-17. Okay. <clears throat> well, what I like to tell people, what's interesting is that this plane's gonna go up 25,000 feet. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna be minus 50 degrees in the plane. So I know it's 105 in there now, they wish it was 105 all the time. Yeah, yeah. Because they've got a special uniform they've gotta wear. I mean, it's cold as heck. You yeah. plug in. You plug in the side, the, exactly, yeah. So now, you, what about you know. this one as far as operational? I see yeah. it's complete. Well, yep. minus the few that like in a blade. In a blade. So the en engines are all intact, but they don't start up. They'd all need restored. Um, this plane's been sitting outside for 50 years. It last flew in 1971. The goal at one time was to get it to fly again, but it's about a four to five million dollar restoration now, yeah. or probably eight to ten years, and you can't find parts for them, you'd have to fabricate, and it really needs all new skin, you'd have to fabricate all that. So I don't know if that's ever going to really happen, unless somebody wins a lottery and decides to say, we love you guys, <laughs> yeah, you know, here's right. some money to, yeah. to restore that. This one never saw any combat, because it came out of uh, the factory May 7th of 1945, and the war ended May 8th, 1945. Yeah. Boeing started building B-17s in the 30s. They couldn't build them fast enough, so they contracted with Douglas and uh, the Vega, uh, comp Vega of uh, Lockheed Vega, uh, the factory. And uh, this, so this one's a Douglas product in Long Beach, built in Long Beach. So instead of going to Europe, it ended up going to Texas, uh, Fort Worth area for five years, and then it became a. Uh, Drone director in the Pacific Island, Islands, it could be, and we acquired it in 1959. Oh, wow. And it flew from 59 to 71. It's the decommissioned B-17 by the Air Force in 1959. Our original founder put it to work. It was in some movies. Uh, it was in a TV series. Uh, in the 60s, there was a TV show called uh, 12 O'Clock High. Oh, yeah. And so it was filmed in there. And... Uh, it would start up in taxi in the in the in the uh, TV show. I, I still to this day tape all the B, the uh, the TV shows, and I don't care about the story. I just fast forward to hopefully see the plane. <laughs> that's all I care to that's do. That's this actual airplane. That's this actual airplane. That is crazy. So big plane, as I tell kids, I tell adults and kids, but it's it's a it's a crew of ten that's in a plane like that. So once you're in there, as you know. You, you, you're stooping down, it's not so big in there, and it's, nothing's built for comfort out of that plane. It's just built to drop bombs over in Germany, and these guys dropped more bombs in Germany than any other B-7, or than the other bomber we had. Mm -hmm. So this is a key plane that won World War II for us. That's mm -hmm. Over 7,000 were lost in Europe. There are a total of eight left that still fly. So that's what we're down to is eight. That's crazy, eight. And we, have, we host one every year from Arizona, from Mesa, it comes here, and we'll host it, and they'll do actually 15 full flights while it's here. So you can actually pay for a flight. On. I did that last year and flew on it. Got great experience. Loved it. And then they brought a B-25 with it, and I flew on the B-25 also. Nice. That was uh, a little bit louder. Yeah, yeah. And not as smooth a ride. <laughs> okay, so now you're walking into the U.S. Enterprise. So you're in an, an aircraft carrier during World War II. Okay. And the Enterprise is the most decorated aircraft carrier we ever had, 120 ba battle stars. And the only reason it survived Pearl Harbor is because it was out at sea. It wasn't in Pearl Harbor at the time. So in here is going to be all Navy planes. That's what you're going to see in here. So this is a F-9F uh, Panther. This was the first jets ever built by Grumman. Remember Grumman built um, Tiger Cats, Bear Cats, Hell Cats, Wild Cats. So they built the Panther as their first. Oh, keeping with the cat theme. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you got to stick with And so works. when the Korean War started, these guys went against um, 
MiG-15s. Mm. Well, MiG-15s have swept wings. I mean, that was revolutionary to flying. These guys didn't. So they had difficulty with that. So then they eventually built um, the same plane, except for they put the same jet, except for they put swept wings on it, and they called it a Cougar mm. instead of a Panther. This guy was a reconnaissance plane. So if you look at the red tag plate at the side, there's one on each side and one underneath. When you take that off, that's a camera that's oh, in there. Very cool. So this particular one would have done 200, over 200 sorties during uh, the Korean War for reconnaissance, for pictures. But Cougars were flying by, flown by some iconic people during the Korean War. The guy by the name of uh, Neil Armstrong flew those. The guy by the name of John Glenn mm. flew those. And if you're a baseball fan, one of the, probably the five best hitters of all time flew one of these uh, named Ted Williams. There you go. He flew, and he also flew in World War II. So he was the only Major League Baseball player to fly in both wars to do that. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's super neat. Yeah. So this plane here is very interesting because if you look at the very front, you'll see a propeller. If you look at the very back, you'll notice there's a jet right <laughs> yeah, here. Like, uh oh, is this one of them? So this is called an FR1 by a company called Ryan. And so if you're a pilot, I don't know if you, you're very interested in getting a plane that's called Fireball, but that's the name of the plane, would be a Fireball. They built 66 of these, and these were the first planes that ever went, the first jets to ever go off an aircraft carrier was an FR-1 fireball. They weren't 100% sure how this jet thing was gonna work at the time, why they, made, why they made it a hybrid. And part of the jet idea was to give you extra uh, uh, thrust, so to speak. And then if you're up in the air also and you're engaged in a battle, you can kick in the jet and that will give you manu better maneuverability. That was the idea behind that. So once they figured out the jet thing was going to work, they kind of stopped this process. And uh, all 66, that's the last one left. Does not fly anymore, but that's the last one of 66. There are no more. So they had a regular radial engine on the front of it that they would use just as traditional power or whatever. That's correct. And then they were using it as a test bed platform for the jet propulsion side of things. Correct. Wow. Correct. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Yep, better known as a, like a hybrid, so to speak. The next one you see is an 81 Sky Raider. Gosh, that's a big old Isn't that a big plane? These were, these were great planes in Korea, and they were so good, they kept these into Vietnam. And it's the last propeller plane we would fly in Vietnam. And if you look under the wings... Oh, there. PT-19 or the trainer. Yeah, sure, this is a trainer. Yeah. So if you look under the wings, let's see if I can do this with my pointer, you'll see these holes. So you would see one, two, three, four, five, six on each wings, and those are called hard points. And uh, you would attach rockets to those. Mm -hmm. There'd be another one under here and then the other side, so that's two more. And then underneath, directly underneath, would be a bomb. So you have 15 hard points on the <laughs> wings. Insane. I mean, that's, yeah, that's why they, the, the, the power from this plane was incredible. Great engines on these. This is like the A-10 of World yeah, War II. Yeah, yeah. It's just a and, an, and another plane that could take a licking and keep on ticking. One of those planes, just a strong, strong yeah. plane. Then you have the Dauntless. So now you're going back to World War II again. And this is the plane that won the Battle of Midway for us. It's a dive bomber, uh, be a crew of two. So you have a pilot, and then behind him would be um, a gunner. Really, there would be a 50 caliber machine gun up there, and he's looking the opposite direction of where you're flying, because when he's diving at 80, 70, 80 degrees, straight down at the water at an aircraft carrier, he's got to protect everything 180 degrees behind you to do that. Where the flaps would normally be, those slats, those are speed brakes, and they come up like yes. this. Yep. So those, as he goes down, they would deploy like that to control his airspeed, like speed brakes, so that they wouldn't get too fast as he's staying controlled in an in almost vertical dive. Correct. Crazy. And the reason they came up with that, eventually, originally they didn't start with that, but when they were diving, the back ends were buffeting so bad, they knew they were going to lose the back end. And somebody came up with the idea, I don't know who, but uh, some engineer came up with the, the perforated dive brakes, like you call them, or speed brakes. Mm -hmm. And then they, the, splat, the, the, uh, the flap split open. Do you know who came up with the open flap idea? Do you know who ever, two guys by the name of the Wright brothers came up with that idea. Oh, there you go. Yeah, they came up with that. 
Yeah. I heard about them guys. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> so is that a torpedo? That is. So that torpedo would be carried by the Avenger. That's the Avenger right there. So, that's an Avenger. So that's, you have a dive bomber, and then this is a torpedo bomber. So the downside to torpedo bombers is they have to stay low by the water, 100, 150, 250 feet off the water. So, and remember, they're slower. So they're easier targets to shoot at by the Japanese as they're dropping a Mark 13 torpedo. That was the idea. So Gr <laughs> Grumman built these. He designed this. This one was built by General Motors. So Grumman could not build fast enough because he's building Hellcats and Wildcats. So he contracts with General Motors. They have the Eastern Aircraft Company who's not building cars. And so General Motors ends up building these for us, which is what this one is here. So they ended up building 7,000, uh, over 7,000 of these. And then Grumman only built 2,300 of them. So they, they tripled the building capacity for, uh, for Grumman for these planes. It's a unique very unique wing structure. You'll notice the wings aren't up in the air, so they go more like a bird. Mm. And it's called stowaway system is the name of the system. And uh, it's really cool. This plane is 19 feet wide when the wings are folded. When the wings come out, expanded, they're 57 feet wide. Wow. Excuse me, 54 feet wide. If you do the math, Take 19 into 54, it's almost three planes. So you can put three planes side by side by side on an aircraft versus just extending the wings out for once. They really figured that out nicely. And it has no overhead clearance. No, zero, does not, the overhead clearance has no, yeah, not like nothing. It's there. not like those guys. And the Dauntless wings don't fold because of the diving capability has to do, it would not, withstand the pressure of the wing structure if, if it had to do that, if it had to dive. Yeah. Well, this guy, it would be different on this guy because it's a, it's a torpedo. So crew of three in a plane like this, you have a pilot, radio operator, and you have the, um, uh, the gunner, the gunner, uh, tail gunner, and the, the radio operators underneath him. Oh, weird. Oh, so yeah, he would, be in, the, he would be in the belly. He would be in the belly. Weird. Yeah, you'd, and so during World War II, our first President Bush would have flown this plane in World War II. Wow, crazy. In fact, actually was shot down and survived being shot down in a, in a plane like this. In 1944, five of these went missing in the Bermuda Triangle. They were on a training mission that wasn't supposed to last longer than a three hour tour. They went out, there he is, their compasses got a little wonky because it's the Bermuda Triangle after all. All five of them went missing, then, the Navy sent another ship out. I think it might have been it's one a, of those, actually. It was a PBY, I think. A PBY. Yeah. It was some sort of reconnaissance that held like 20 people or something, 12 people, to go out looking for them. That plane also disappeared. Now, what I want to do is take one of these, because there's only a handful still flying, and refly the actual Bermuda Triangle route that they would have flown and see if we can't find them. Because there's some speculations, a couple parts and pieces have been found, but nothing mm. absolutely confirmed. I think that would be an awesome adventure to see if we can't find the actual five Avengers while flying an Avenger over there. That would be like super Jimmy World big box check. So let me know whatever information you have about it. Throw in the comments, shoot me an email. It's all in the description. What would help us find those five, six missing airplanes from that mission. That would be an awesome trip. That's it, there's a good story. Because all they had to do was go out, three left turns is all they had to make. Yep. Go out straight, make a left turn, left turn, come back to the, uh, the coast and fly back down. That's all they had to do, but they went too far south was their problem. So the first left turn took them then north east instead of directly north. Mm. Fly, you remember the name of that? Flight 19. Flight 19. That's yeah. it. It's a great story. Yeah. And then the plane that went out to find them, it's saying you blew up in the sky. That's that's really sad. Yeah. Is that what they know, or is that that's, what that's the, well? The that's what the that's what the story says. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's what I've read on it. Sure. Yeah. And it was you're right. It was a training mission. Yeah. And it was like at the <clears> end of the war too. Yeah. In fact, I thought it was 1945, it not 44. Yeah, okay. It been. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But it's a great story. That one, that and the George Bush story. We always tell the George Bush one. We don't usually tell Flight 19. <laughs>
Let's see here. Come on, let's go over. We go so far into the. There's another company called Fighter Rebuilders, and they lease the building from us. So I can't so take isn't the people in there. The owner of that, the president Correct. of the museum. President of the museum is the owner Steve. of Fighter Rebuilders. Steve yeah. is that Steve his name? Hinton. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So he was one of the guys I've been. So this, here's a P-51. This is a Reno Air Racing plane. Um, when the Reno Air Races started in 1964, there was a guy named Clay Lacey that flew P-51s, and he owned this plane here. So it's, yeah. so it's interesting about this plane. Eventually, he sold this to a gal named Vicki Benzing. And Vicki's also an air racer, and she also does barnstorming things. So she bought it. She wanted it completely torn apart. So they took it from this hangar, moved it over to that hangar right there, and Steve and his crew completely redid that plane. It's painted purple because that's how Clay painted it. But the reason it continues to be purple is because when Clay had it painted purple years ago, he ordered 15 gallons of purple paint and 1,500 gallons came in. Oh. So it's going to be painted purple for a long, <laughs> long time. Yeah, we can repaint it every year. Every for year. Oh, wow. The pilot, it's funny, the pilot who, I wish Robbie was here, he'll tell you the story. The pilot who flew it down from Reno because it needed to get some work on it a little bit more, he was telling me, a couple of days later, so I'm still seeing purple. <laughs> and it's unfortunate. The reason they need to repaint it is because when it was in Reno, it was on the tarmac, and a, a gust of wind came up, and some people had some 10 by 10 easy ups, and they didn't anchor them down, and it, it blew right at the plane. And so it dented it and, and uh, scratched it really well. Yeah. yeah. So now they're back to painting it again. I was going to say, you see all the yep. coverings of the yep. tufts. Yep. What's the deal with the A10? Yeah, those are all drones, like drones, like RCs, yeah. radio control models. Yeah, they're big. I was going to say, that's a huge. Yeah. There's a couple more on the back side back there. Oh, yeah, you can see the yeah. desert, yeah. whatever like, color that is. Yeah, like a camouflage color. Yeah. yeah a couple back like there. Are those military ones, or are they personal I think owned, I think or? that's probably personal owned. I don't think they're military. Gosh. There's another PT right there, PT-19. Yeah. yeah. The wings are off right now. The wings are right here. There's some cool, I wish I could take you back, some cool stuff back there. There's a P-39 by Bell oh, back there. Cool. There's a P-59 by Bell back there. That's the first the jet. That's the, it's, a, it's an Aero Comet. It's the first jet we ever built in the United States was by Bell. Oh, wow. It's back there. Uh, in the far back right corner is a Val, a Japanese Val. There's probably three Vals left in the world. Pearl Harbor just got one last year and that they're working on. And then we have one of the three in there, and, and but we've stopped working on it because we just don't have uh, the, the time to do put anything together on it. So I'm hoping sure. we can eventually get together because that's a great one to show with our Japanese collection when I show it to you. That's right. Well, speaking yeah. of that, want to head there now? Yeah, sure. Let's go. We'll go up to the foreign hangar. And then you notice it's, uh, I mean, this is called a dry decker, Falker DR1. Yeah. Dry decker meaning three wings. There really is a fourth wing if you look underneath. Mm. It's almost like a fourth wing. I mean, you go <laughs> kind of good. Yeah, that's it. There you go. There you go. Every little bit helps. But again, you see machine guns. You know, it looks like you're going to take off the propeller. So the Germans, when they first came up with that system, they put metal on the back of their <laughs> propellers, and then the bullets would go all over the place and sometimes back at them. And then they eventually stole that system from the, from, the, uh, from the French. French came up with that idea first of the interrupter system. Sopwith Pup. You've heard of Sopwith Camel. This is the Pup. Pup's a little smaller. When they first built these, Thomas Sopwith called these a strut and a half. So that's a strut. And then you see the half, oh, the half. Yeah, and then he changed the name to a Pup. That's what he ended up changing it to. And then this famous story of Snoopy versus the Red Baron. That's why we put Snoopy on the top of the Red Baron there, so kids can ask us that question. There you go, that's right. I will end with this game. Yeah, you, you got to have a Rolls or a foreign car in a, in a yeah, foreign hangar, right? Horse, this still flies. It flies. It still, it still, still flies. runs. I know. Convertible. It's the last year of the single headlight, so I think it's around 1959 in there. Mm -hmm. And it was donated to the museum. Nice donation to the museum. Yeah. 
the heaviest car. Yeah, it looks heavy. Oh my gosh, look, they over-engineered everything. It on looks that like a car. tank. It is ridiculous how. Over yeah, you're going to be safe in there. If you're hit by somebody, you're safe. Yeah, in that yeah, car. Yeah, it's a tank. Yeah, it, it looks heavy. That's a funky looking airplane. So you're looking at near the end of World War II, and Germans are losing pilots. It's it is a jet. Uh, it's called a Volks Jager. So if you remember a Volkswagen, mm -hmm. Volkswagen is a people's car, mm -hmm. Volkswagen is the people's fighter. So this would have been the Volkswagen, a lot of wood it's made out of. Uh, the engine is the same engine that's on an ME262. I was gonna say it's from the- It's right there. So now they're running out of pilots, so they're looking for pilots to fly, so they're gonna have Hitler's youth, start training Hitler's youth to fly that plane. Well, Hitler's youth is how old? 10 to 15 years of age, somewhere in there. So they're going to fly this plane. And so <laughs> some of these were built with ejection seats. Yeah. So now if you have trouble flying it, you some want to eject out. Were. Yeah. So if you eject where you're going to head to, you're probably a good chance you're going to go into the engine if you eject out when you eject up on these planes. So not the best design. There was a guy during World War II named Bob Hoover, famous oh. pilot and then became a test pilot. And Bob got in one of these and flew it up in Edwards Air Force Base. Back then it was called Muroc. Air Force Base, and he changed the name to Edwards up in Lancaster, California. And he flies it, he gets off the plane, tells a crewman, don't let anybody ever get in that plane again. That's the hardest plane I've ever flown. And you, Bob Hoover can fly anything. Wow. You just have to know Bob. Yeah, because he was doing air shows oh, and yeah. all kinds of Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Air racing. Yeah. 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 No, he was good. Wow. So, um, anyway, that's, that's the Volkswagen. Yep, yeah. Well, you've got one more to look at. Weird little things. All right, what do we got? So, you know what a B-29 nose looks like? Yes. So, we have a plane over here. If you see that, looks like a B-29, but actually it's a B-50. B-50s replaced B-29s. And this is a very famous B-50. So, let me give you the story on this plane here. <clears throat> and again, it's 1949. After World War II, we're not friends with Russia anymore. And what's Russia doing? They're working on nuclear weapons. So remember in 1945, we took two B-29s and we were able to drop atomic bombs over Japan. So B-29 is not gonna be able to go to Russia, but we want to show Russia we have a plane that can fly anywhere in the world and drop an atomic bomb. So they took five B-50s at an airport in, uh, in, uh, in Texas and they were gonna take one to one and see if they could go around the world. So the first one takes off named Global Queen. Takes off, gets to the Azores, but when it gets to the Azores, it, an engine catches fire, so they have to leave it at the Azores. Second plane is Lucky Lady 2, this guy here, flies to the Azores, gets refueled, flies to Saudi Arabia, gets refueled, flies to the Philippines, gets refueled, flies to Hawaii, gets refueled, comes back to Texas. All the refueling is done in the air, never yeah. landing. And that's after 94 hours and one minute, it comes back and lands in Texas to show Russia, we have a plane that can be refueled in the air and drop an atomic bomb anywhere we want to. So in my opinion, this plane helped stop World War III, yeah. so to speak. <clears throat> so the, the planes that refueled it were B-29s. And there's five differences between a B-29 and a B-50. The first difference is the glass plate in the front that's round there, on a B-29, it's separate panes. Mm -hmm. This is all one pane. I know there's no engines on it, but the second thing is the engines are stronger on a B-50 than a B-29. There's no tail section on it, but the tail section is higher on a B-50 than a B-29. More armament on a B-50 than a B-29 and the, the, the uh, skin is thicker on a B-50 than a B-29. Both of them have, are pressurized, but the skin's thicker on this guy right here. So, so, and there's no B-50s left that fly. There are two B-29s left that fly. You might have seen one or two of them. One's called Doc, yeah. and one's called Fifi. Yeah, Fifi is the one that was at Oshkosh that we flew I was gonna, in. I was gonna say, if you go to Oshkosh once in a while, you'll see it there. Yeah. Now, Doc, we hosted Doc three years ago, and I got to fly in Doc, so it was here. Oh. Um, once in a while, we get to host planes and fly in them. I, I was talking to your son while you were on the phone, because you went to Oshkosh this year. Mm -hmm. Did you see the Connie that was yeah. there? So that's our Connie. 
The Constellation? The Constellation, that's ours. So are you guys getting the interior refurbished right now in Oregon at Aurora? No, um, in fact, I just talked to Steve about that today. So um, I'll back up. The Connie was sold to a private buyer Yeah. and we restored it totally for him. And um, it's because it, it's so big, we can't fit it in our museum. It's got to go to another hangar on the other side of the airport. And the goal was to get it ready for Oshkosh, which it did, it went to Oshkosh but it came back because it needs some work done to the engine and then it will be leaving to go to Oregon and get a whole new plush leather interior and then we probably won't see it again after that. That's the shop we were at. That's my cousin works at that shop. Now what's, where's it at? What In part of Oregon? Aurora, Oregon near you know. McMinnville. Oh really? Wow, yeah, how cool is that? Yeah, Aero Metal. So when he when it gets up there, you got to go see it. I well, mean, he's got to call you, you and tell you. I know it's up they were there. telling me because of me because you got my understanding. The only flying constellation left, right, in the U.S. And I've heard disputed that this one was MacArthur's during the Korean War, so okay. it's called Bataan. Okay. But there's also one by Dwight Eisenhower that is still around, and but I don't know if it flies or not. And I forgot the name of it, but I don't know if it flies or not. Okay. Because they were telling me that was the only, and, and they said there was one other one, maybe is what you're talking about, but it wasn't a U.S. registered airport. No, there's another one down in Australia. I had a guy here from Australia last week, and he says, well, we have the other one. Okay, yeah. I said, well, where? He said, well, it's in Aus it's Australia. I said, oh, okay, I didn't know there was a third one. It's this a beautiful. such a small world. I know it really is. Yo, you got it the, is. Oh, I have to have a cousin that works at the shop. That is crazy. Does that. And if you saw the video by the time this one came out, the video would have been out for a few weeks. So there you go. Thanks, Tyler, again for that. You guys rock.